Um, so, oh, oh. okay, here we go. Um, so the objectives of today's lecture is to understand the pertinent questions to ask a urogyne patient, learn how to perform a physical exam specific to urogyne complaints, and understand the role of testing for our urogyne patients. Um, so yeah, we'll just get right into it. And so um, these are kind of made up cases, but kind of your basic stuff that you would see. Um, so first patient here is a 42 year old who presents with a complaint of urinary leakage. So what do you guys want to know? Anybody, you know, unmute, ring in, just start asking some questions. If this patient came to you, what, were, what would be the types of things that you would want to ask her? So I want to know, um, it, hi, I'm Brittany. I'm one of the interns. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, there's lots of questions I would want to know. So I'd want to know her G's and P's. Did she have vaginal deliveries? Um, and then I want to know the, all the urogyne questions. So <laughs> does she have leakage when she sneezes or coughs? Does she have mm -hmm. urgency? Does she leak before, because she has urgency and can't get to the bathroom on time? Does she feel like pelvic pressure or feel like something is falling out? Um, how much water does she drink a day? How much caffeine does she drink a day? Um, does she have to wear a pad because she's leaking so much? Um, how often or how much is the pad having to be changed and is it saturated? Does she have like post void like um, dribbling? Does she, um, let's see, any bleeding, pelvic pain, uh, burning when she pees? Does she have any history of UTIs? All that good stuff. Yeah, perfect. I mean, that was that pretty much covered it. There's a a whole lot there, but yeah, I mean, definitely like what I have is, you know, the main stuff. Again, as you said, when are you leaking? What are you doing when you leak? So that's the whole coughing, laughing, sneezing thing. Like when you have the urge, can you make it? Do you feel like you're not emptying your bladder well? Are you waking up at night to pee? Um, and are you already waking up wet? The whole pads exactly what you said. Um, and then in terms of like what else you want to know, similarly, um, any issues with, with having to wait for urine to start or not emptying well, any issues with your bowel movements, um, and then bulge symptoms. Um, so for our patient, um, she does report leakage with coughing and sneezing, playing with her kids, running or any type of exercise. Uh, it's been present since the delivery of her first child, but getting worse. Oh, I think I forgot to say that she, she was a, she's a G3, P3. Um, it's coming up. Um, so it's been present since the delivery of her first child, but it's getting worse multiple times a day. She has to change pads three or four times a day. Um, and they're fairly wet. They're not completely soaked, but they're wet when she's changing them. Um, she is able to make it to the bathroom without leaking. She wakes up only once a night to void, and that doesn't bother her at all. Um, she does have bowel movements daily. She doesn't have to strain and she doesn't have any symptoms of a vaginal prolapse. So this is kind of looking into um, a little bit more about when you're asking or when you're looking at a patient's past medical history or asking them about general past medical history. Um, this acronym came up. I can't remember where I found it from. Some, some textbook I was reading, um, but the acronym is DIAPERS which, you know, I like. I mean, don't tell your patients that because they don't want to think about wearing diapers, but anyway. Um, so the D stands for dementia or delirium. For sure, if you have a, pa a patient with um, a little bit of like cognitive um, defects or deficits, they're, sometimes that can for sure add into their urine leakage just because they're not aware of when they have to go or what, what's really going on down there. So. Um, I stands for infection, for sure. If someone has a urinary tract infection, that can increase their risk of leaking. Uh, atrophic vaginitis also um, can actually come from urine leakage. Definitely the urine can be really, um, really tough on the skin. Um, but then again, psychological, pharmacologic, endocrine, restricted mobility, stool impaction, all of these things can play a role in urine leakage. Um, so again, in terms of uh, other like medical history type stuff, so of course for surgical history, again, as, as you mentioned, Brittany, you'd want to know what her G's and P's are um, and definitely like any other surgeries that she's had. Definitely, um, you know, other in general surgical history is important and I also in 
I like to know what their surgical history was in case there were any other abdominal surgeries. But for sure, I would say obstetrical surgery and pelvic surgery are kind of more important for us um, to begin with. So for our patient, she's essentially healthy, no significant abdominal or pelvic surgical history. She is a G3P3 with no assisted deliveries, um, and her largest baby was eight pounds, six ounces. So what do you want to do next? I mean, again, you've obtained your history. This is kind of easy. What do you want to do after you obtain a history on a patient? Physical exam. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so, of course, you want to do a physical exam. And for us, um, I think what's most important is really the pelvic exam. Um, so you do want to inspect the external genitalia. Um, a neurologic assessment of the perineum is important too, just again in the sense of um, if there are any issues with sensation um, around the perineum, you'd be concerned that there was some other neurologic issue going on as well. Um, we always look at pelvic support, so that would be the prolapse, ex prolapse exam, which I'll get into that later. Um, we also check a PVR, and that could be either with bladder scan or straight cath. Um, perform a cough stress test, um, and also perform a speculum exam. So, uh, of note here, I didn't I didn't put it in here, but usually, you know if if a patient comes to me um, mentioning that she's leaking with coughs, laughs, sneezes, um, I generally don't have her urinate or I, basically I, tr I try to kind of make sure that she has a somewhat of a full bladder while we're doing the cough stress test just because i think you know the more full a bladder is the more uh, chance you'll see a leak from her um so that's just something to be aware of that if a patient does have that complaint i usually do have them do a cough test um, before having them empty their bladders um, some of them do obviously some of them do urinate like right when they come in, that's fine. But again, if you have that opportunity, just make sure that they don't go first before you do that. Um, so for our patient, she has normal appearing, well estrogenized external genitalia, normal sensation, no prolapse when she valsalvas, but she does have some urethral hypermobility. Um, I didn't have any um, pictures of that at all, but it's I would say you, if you were examining her and you had the patient valsalva, a lot of times you can actually see like that anterior wall of the vagina move a little bit. Um, and so that's kind of what I mean. That's, that's kind of what I'm looking for. So no overt prolapse, but you could probably see some movement of the urethra um, and the anterior vaginal wall. Um, so she did leak urine on our cough stress test. Um, her PBR was 15, so really not concerning whatsoever and otherwise her normal her speculum exam speculum exam was normal so um other tests that are available when someone comes in for urinary leakage um so the other tests that are available are things that we should look at are uh ua urine culture um and of course that really again if someone has an infection that could add into or be the cause of her urinary leakage, um, which of course then that would be an easy cure because you just uh, give her antibiotics for her um, infection. But that, that is something that you'd want to look for. Um, sometimes we do have patients fill out bladder diaries and those bladder diaries are there to assess the intake and output um, or their fluid intake and output. Um, and also they're, if they are leaking with urge or if they leak, we kind of have them um, note down if they're leaking with an activity or with the urge. So, um, and then I actually, I actually, this is a, just an example of um, a bladder diary. So this is, I took this from this website, Voices for PFD, PFD for is uh, pelvic floor disorders. Um, and it's actually this website, um, that is also put out by the American Urogynecologic Uro Society. It's a great resource for patient um, handouts. Um, we use this a lot in our office uh, just because it's pretty educational. Um, but so this bladder diary, basically what I usually tell my patients is that I'm looking for, I want them to record um, what time they go to the bathroom, how much comes out when they void, but also record 
what time they drink and how much, um, or what, what time they drink, what they're drinking and how much. Um, as you can see, we don't really use like leak volume to mean anything, but again, I wanna know if there's some sort of activity while they're leaking and then was there an urge um, at that time as well. Um, I usually tell my patients that I want them to give me a good 24 hours of, um, of a diary. Uh, they don't have to be, and I usually ask for about three days. They don't have to be three in a row, but I do want that full 24 hours. Um, so I always tell them first pee in the morning all the way until for after the first pee the next morning. So, um, and then the last other test that we sometimes get is the urodynamics test. Um, urodynamics is not really recommended for uncomplicated patients, um, but of course they can be used in complicated um, or neurogenic bladder type patients or patients that are refractory to any sort of treatments that we've already tried. Um, and sometimes we use them in patients considering surgery, not all the time, but again, it's kind of on a case by case basis. Um, so other information about urodynamics, basically kind of the way I describe the urodynamics to patients is that we use these catheters that have pressure sensors on the end to measure what the bladder is doing while it's being filled, um, as well as how the bladder reacts when it's, um, when it comes time to empty. So we have one catheter in the bladder that assesses bladder pressure. And there's one catheter that goes either in the vagina or rectum, which measures the abdominal pressure. In terms of whether or not to use the vagina or rectum, it has to do with if someone has prolapse. Usually if there's a patient with prolapse, um, I generally put the catheter in the rectum because with the prolapse, that can kind of change the abdominal pressure that you're looking at. And also, usually patients who have prolapse, the reason why we're doing urodynamics is we're trying to assess whether or not they're gonna have potentially urinary incontinence after surgery. Um, so what we're doing with the prolapse is that we actually reduce the prolapse in the office. So if there's a catheter there and we're kind of pushing around to reduce the prolapse, it could affect the abdominal pressure. Um, so again, patient input is also obtained during your dynamic testing. Basically, as the patient, um, as the bladder is getting filled, we usually ask the patient to tell us when they start to feel a sensation of filling, when they feel that first desire to use the bathroom, when is that desire stronger, and then when have they completely hit their capacity and they just cannot hold any longer. Um, during the testing, we also stop the filling at certain points to perform cough stress tests. So at certain volumes, I'll, have, I'll stop the filling and have the patient cough, and we'll see if they can, uh, if they can leak with the coughs and, and also Valsalvas. Um, so again, like I said, we are also looking at detrusor pressure with bladder emptying. Again, sometimes we do utilize urodynamic testing for patients who have trouble emptying, who have urinary retention. Um, and with that, we just want to be looking at how or what is the bladder doing um, when the patient is supposed to be emptying. Um, is, the, is the pressure not high enough and that's why they're having trouble emptying? Um, is there something else going on with the bladder that they can't empty well? Um, and kind of going along with that, we also do um, an EMG at the same time um, of the pelvic muscles to assess the pelvic muscle function. So again, it's kind of similar with if a patient's not emptying well, we could potentially see um, like high tone pelvic muscles, or we can tell that the, the patient's trying really hard to urinate based on their muscle function. So, um, and then this is just an example of one of the catheters. This is one of the, the um, this is one of the catheters that go into the bladder. So it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but here's one sensor. Here's the second sensor. This is, they actually make catheters that just have one sensor. This one, there's two because we actually use it also to measure specifically urethral pressure. Um, but then this part of the catheter is what's connected to the bag of fluid. So that's what's filling the bladder. Um, so other things to know about urodynamic testing. Um, so when we're looking at the tracing for urodynamics, there are three main pressures that we're looking at. It's the PVES, the PABD, and the PDET. So PVES is the vesicle pressure with, uh, within the bladder. PABD is abdominal pressure. The PDET is actually a calculated pressure, um, which kind of makes sense because if you can't 
in terms of what the detrusor pressure is, it's actually the pressure um, on the walls of the bladder. And so P vesicle is actually a measure of pressure within the bladder. But of course, if you think about the bladder being itself within the abdominal cavity, um, PVS will always have a extra abdominal pressure on top of it. So that's why we have to calculate what PDED is. So PDED is PVS minus uh, P abdomen. Now this is, um, this is kind of a basic tracing that shows stress urinary incontinence. I just realized that kind of the bottom part where potentially you would see the flow or the leak is cut off. But basically what this is showing is that um, when you look at PVS and P abd, um, if they, they should look equal until something happens. Um, and then what I mean by that is again, with PDET, because it's calculated, if the, if you're, um, subtracting PAB from PVS, then this should always be at a steady state unless something happens, which again, you'll see in the next slide. Um, but so this is just showing that these high peaks are coughs that the patient has, and then this lower peak is a Valsalva. This first um, trial, I believe, was done at about 100 milliliters, and it's negative. We didn't have any leaks with, the, with uh, those stress maneuvers. Um, the next time we try that is about 200 uh, um, milliliters of, of sterile water in. Um, it's also noted that the patient, um, the patient mentioned that she felt a strong desire to go. Um, but again, not shown here, but she did leak when she coughed and then she did leak with a Valsalva. So that's kind of your usual stress urinary incontinence. And again, that's a little, actually probably a little bit more visual on the patient versus what shows up in the on the tracing because again you're looking at what the patient's doing also though and she definitely leaked urine um, during those maneuvers um, so this is an example of detrusor overactivity uh, and real the real focus is right here so again you've got pvs and p ab kind of going along together your p dead is pretty at a pretty stable state um, until you hit this point where the patient says she feels like she has to go. And if you look at what's happening, you can see that her abdominal pressure actually stays steady. So she's not doing anything. There's no activity from her that's pushing on the bladder. It's the bladder itself that starts to kind of increase its pressure. And that's when she's feeling that strong desire. Um, so again, you can just kind of see that right here. Um, so there's another thing that we sometimes look for, which is stress-induced detrusor contractions. These are we don't see it often, but for sure, I've had patients who will tell me that they leak when they cough. And so, of course, your first thought is stress incontinence, nice and easy. Um, but if a patient also says, well, I also have um, really strong urges and I leak a little bit with, with these urges. And so at that point, you kind of really want to pinpoint what's happening. Sometimes it is pure mixed. So people do have both, but sometimes it can be this, which, which is stress induced detrusor contractions. Um, so if you look right here and right here, what you're looking at is that when this patient coughs, um, you have that cough spike, which is pretty normal. But then when she's at rest, you can tell that she's at rest because the uh, abdominal pressure is at rest. But something just happened here. So basically, right after she coughs, her bladder starts to increase its pressure, kind of contracts a little bit. Um, and that's strictly, again, because you know she's at rest, she's not really doing it. It's the bladder that's doing it. Um, here, she mentions that she has a strong desire. Um, but it's kind of hard to exactly, there's, it looks like there might be movement here too. So, um, so hard to know if that's a true bladder um, contraction. But again, here, this is the same thing where we see a, she coughs and then has this pretty distinct increase in her bladder pressure. So those are stress induced detrusor contractions. I've had a few patients who have told me that they have stress incontinence. We're pretty much ready to go to surgery for stress incontinence. But we do this just because, again, she has other complaints, and this is what I see. And if that's the case, I actually usually just try to treat the detrusor contractions first and actually don't move to surgery just yet. Um, because there is a possibility that when she, if we treat the overactive bladder, she may not actually have any more leakage with coughs. 
So back to our patient, when we talked about any of these other tests, the question is, do we need, do we need any other tests? So do we think for our patient, do we think she needs a urinalysis and urine culture? Anybody can answer yes or no. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So again, pretty much usually everybody, obviously the urinalysis and urine culture is like a super easy test to do. Um, and everyone should get that just to be sure that there's no infection. So her test was negative. Um, does anybody think we need to do a bladder diary for her? Yes. So she, I, ooh, sorry. Uh, I don't think it's necessary for this patient again, because she's pretty, um, she's pretty clear on when she's leaking. Um, and I really, I don't think we're going to glean any extra information from the bladder diary. Um, and so for her, do we need urodynamic testing? Right. So again, unnecessary. No. She's a pretty uncomplicated patient. She's very straightforward. She knows exactly when this is happening. And she also does not have any other symptoms of, um, of like urgency or anything like that. So I wouldn't recommend that for her. Um, so everybody can chime in here. What's our diagnosis for this patient? Stress urinary incontinence. Perfect. Bye. Um, okay. So now in terms of, um, generally speaking, we're going to go into a little bit of, um, a little bit of teaching about urinary incontinence. So what is it? Basically urinary incontinence is the involuntary leakage of urine from the urethra. It's different from fistulas or congenital malformations of the urinary tract. Um, so stress incontinence is the involuntary leakage of urine with increases in abdominal pressure. So again, those laughs, coughs, sneezes, bending, lifting, um, and urge incontinence is the involuntary leakage uh, associated with a strong imminent need to void. So in general, and again, you'll see these couple slides again when we talk more about overactive bladder, but in general, urinary continence, um, when we talk about urinary incontinence, sorry, when we talk about urinary continence, uh, we're really talking about what's what's where we're talking about the lower urinary tract and in terms of the function of the lower urinary tract which is essentially the bladder um the function of the bladder really is just storage and voiding um i have a lot of patients who kind of ask me about their kidneys and and all that stuff and i'm like nope your kidneys aren't playing any role in this your kidneys are just making urine and delivering it to the bladder and it's the bladder's job to hold it appropriately and let go of it appropriately um, so control of storage and voiding really depends on the normal coordination uh, between a whole bunch of stuff. It's the central and peripheral nervous system, the bladder wall, the detrusor muscle, the urethra, and the pelvic floor musculature. Um, and continence really occurs when the intraurethral pressure is greater than the intravesical pressure. Um, and it should be, uh, and again, we want that pressure to be higher in the urethra at both resting and stress conditions. So at rest, the urethral resistance is generated by an interaction of urethral smooth muscle, urethral wall, elasticity and vascularity, and periurethral striated muscle. Um, the smooth muscle and vascular elastic tissue of the urethra provide constant tension along the urethra. The periurethral striated muscles are present in the distal half of the urethra. Um, and of course, multiple factors can affect each component. So this is just um, a look at how or why stress incontinence incur occurs. Um, this is the hammock hypothesis. So in figure A, what we're looking at is, of course, pubic bone, bladder, urethra. And the black part just represents kind of um, the support structures that are around the anterior vaginal wall and around the suburethral area. Um, so again, in figure A, we're, what this is showing is that when abdominal pressure is pressing down on a stable support, the urethra, ten, the urethra stays closed. So there's no leakage there. In uh, figure B, it's just showing with this part of the support missing, whether it's um, just really loose or stretched out. Obviously, it's not like completely disappeared, but it's just not working anymore. Um, so what they're considering unstable support. And basically the unstable support is ineffective as a, as a backstop, which would keep the urethra compressed. So if you have pressure pushing down on the bladder through the abdomen, 
Uh, if there's no backstop support here, that's going to move the urethra and kind of open it up even uh, or open it up easily. And that's where leakage would occur um, with stress incontinence specifically. Um, and then figure C is really just showing what happens to a lot of patients who have prolapse. Um, having the prolapse kind of creates another layer of support so that a lot of patients, again, when they're bearing down, the urethra tends to stay closed. Um, so for our patient, as we said, she has stress urinary incontinence. So treatment options for stress incontinence uh, include pelvic floor exercises or pelvic floor physical therapy, pessary use, uh, periurethral bulking, or surgical management. Um, and these are the kind of the types of surgeries that we do, although of course, generally we do um, the synthetic mesh slings um, probably about 95% of the time. Um, so real quick, I'll, uh, we can, we're going to talk about the pelvic floor exercises and physical therapy a little bit more, but really what the, um, what the exercises are doing is really just trying to rebuild this support, um, with, mus with the musculature uh, around the urethra. Um, and again, I actually, depending on how severe the stress incontinence is for some patients and also actually I should have put this on the exam, but one of the things that I look for on the exam is also what their pelvic muscle squeezes. So I actually have them do a Kegel squeeze for me during the exam because I want to see, are they using the right muscles or, you know, are they ident identifying the right muscles and, um, how, how well are they doing their squeezes? How long can they hold that squeeze? But so for people who, who seem to do those exercises pretty well, I would probably counsel them on doing stuff on their own at home. Um, for some patients who I feel like they're not really squeezing very well and they, or they're not identifying the muscle at all, um, oftentimes I would also recommend that they go to physical therapy um, to see the pelvic physical therapists who can help um, kind of teach them how to do all that stuff. Um, but yeah, so pessaries, I mean, this is, these two are examples of the incontinence pessaries that we have. Um, the knob here basically is meant to be sitting under the urethra and create that backstop support for the urethra. Um, of course, they shouldn't be blocking the urethra at all in terms of needing to void, but it's more so that they would work during those increases in abdominal pressure. Um, oh yeah, and then this is also, there is, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but there is an over-the-counter um, kind of type, pessary type support thing, and it's called the Poise Impressa. Impressa. Um, it actually, so the sizing kit comes with three different sizes. The, it, the applicator is kind of like a tampon applicator, and then this is what, this is kind of what is inside it when you remove that applicator. Um, it has a string on it, just like a tampon, because it is removable and disposable so people should be able to just take them out and throw them away but the idea is that this larger side um, again is kind of sitting under the urethra and giving that support um, I definitely I don't recommend this too often to patients I've heard a lot of patients say that they feel like it's uncomfortable um, the material itself it's kind of like a fabric or like a cottony kind of material and I think for older women who are postmenopausal it's actually like it's dry it probably just really hurts so um, I generally I don't often recommend it but it's there I kind of I mention it to some patients if they think that they might want to try something like that um, so periurethral bulking uh, is actually something that, uh, and a procedure that we do in the office, and the idea behind periurethral bulking is really that if you imagine the urethra as kind of just this like open drain pipe type of urethra, um, putting some bulking agent in the walls of the urethra will help to keep it more closed. Um, I would say there's probably a certain uh, patient population that would benefit from this, but usually Usually it would be our older patients who maybe can't undergo surgery um, or patients who are kind of looking for kind of like a quicker fix. Um, the bulking agents that, so back in the day when they first developed this, the bulking agent that they used was collagen. Um, now there's a couple other ones out on the market. 
Um, there's one called coaptite, which is basically it's hydroxyapatite. So it's kind of like a biologic um, material. Um, and then there's also something called macroplastic, which is silicone. Um, again, the idea is the same. They all get injected into the same area. Um, the other thing about the bulking agents is that they don't last. So eventually they don't dissolve or anything like that, but eventually those humps kind of just flatten out. Um, so they're not permanent injections and patients do need to return um, to have more placed. Um, and then there is also a limit to how many times they can have the injections repeated. So again, that's why I don't usually recommend this for any sort of long-term effect, but for patients who are much older and can't undergo surgery or are looking for a faster fix, um, you know, while they're, while they're kind of waiting for other things um, like surgery, uh, this, is, this is an option that we have. Um, and then we have surgery for stress incontinence. So the gold standard is the synthetic mid urethral slings. Um, on occasion, we do also perform the autologous fascial sling. Um, and then one of the um, original older surgeries is the birch copal suspension. So in terms of slings, um, we have two different mid types of mid urethral slings. We actually have three, which I didn't put here, but um, we'll just go through these because um, I think they're the most common. So we have the retropubic sling and the transobturator sling. Um, the difference between the two, so the retropubic does go right behind the pubic bone. And as this says, it's kind of like a U shape right under the urethra. The transobturator sling goes out to the um, obturator membrane in the obturator space. Um, and the placement is a little bit more lateral. So it's kind of more like a smile and less like a U. Um, the retropubic slings were developed in the mid 90s. Um, and again, the idea behind the retropubic slings is that backboard support to the urethra. Um, the transobturator slings were uh, first described in 2001. Um, some of the benefits of the transobturator sling is that it avoids bladder, bowel, or vascular inju injuries. Um, just again, kind of when you're going more lateral, you're missing some of the um, larger, well, so you're also, you're completely not entering near any sort of bowels or bladder or um, blood vessels. And it still does provide um, somewhat of a supportive platform. Um, and then there was a study looking at the difference between the retropubic slings and the, um, or sorry, not difference, but um, kind of just comparing the two with uh, equivalence. Um, so we've got the retropubic uh, mid urethral slings had a little bit higher uh, risk of bladder injuries and the pelvic vis visceral and vascular injuries. Um, interestingly, there was more, or they saw more mesh erosion or exposure than the transobturators, although I, I'm not really sure why, because they're kind of sort of put in the same place. Um, there, ha there was more de novo urgency and urge incontinence with the retropubics, um, as well as more of a risk with bladder outlet obstruction and UTIs. And I believe the UTIs had to do more with urinary retention and the bladder outlet obstruction. Um, but yeah, so the TOTs had equivalent outcomes compared to the retropubics, and there was a lower risk of urethral obstruction, urinary retention, um, and the need for sling release. Um, there were more complications related to the groin in regards to pain, leg weak weakness, and numbness. Um, and they weren't recommended for recurrent stress incontinence or uh, intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Um, so I guess that, I mean, you know, and I think it's interesting. I think that people, everybody kind of, I, I would say people just use what they're comfortable with. I generally just use retropubic midgery throw things because I do more of them and I just feel more comfortable with them. And to be honest, I've had uh, more patients who've had TOs um, complain of like the groin pain, the leg pain, um, just being unhappy with kind of the discomfort around the groin. So, um, so I just do the, the retropubic slings. Um, so the autologous fascial slings, uh, they're also known as the pubovaginal slings. They're placed um, a little bit, they're not placed at the mid urethra, they're actually placed closer to the bladder neck. Um, and again, but it's still that same idea where it reestablishes a supportive platform for the urethra. 
Um, the long-term success of them rely on the healing and fibrotic process, um, and they can be used as primary stress incontinence surgery or for recurrent stress incontinence. Um, they can functionally close the urethra in urethral and bladder reconstruction surgeries, which is kind of way out of, that's more of a urology thing. Um, patients who refuse synthetic mesh, I've had those. Um, and I've had patients uh, more so who've had prior surgeries. And then um, when I say tissue integrity concerns, it's more we've had patients who have had mesh erosions or exposures. Um, that we've had to remove the mesh and then they're still having stress incontinence. And so we generally just go with the fascial slings just for concern of you know, future uh, mesh erosion again. So this is just, um, I have a few slides on how the, the autologous fascial slings are done. So basically you make a low transverse um, incision and um, get down to the fascia and basically cut out a piece of fascia to create your own sling. Um, and then the ends of the fascia, um, you have uh, permanent sutures placed at the ends of the sling. So, um, and then in terms of the vaginal incision and the vaginal um, creation of the tunnels, it's basically the same as, as what we do for the mid urethral slings, for the synthetic slings. Um, so you make a midline incision in the vagina, you're basically making these tunnels to laterally, um, uh, to the urethra. Um, and then using this stamy needle, basically it's just a long needle that has an eye at the end so that you can thread the sutures. So basically the stamy needle, what's happening up here is that uh, you're basically creating a little bit of a space behind, um, it's, it's, it's a retropubic space. So you're creating a space behind the pubic bone, passing that stamy needle through and then out through the vaginal tunnels. Um, threading your suture through, and you do that on both sides. And then, if you had like, uh, clearly you need an assistant for this, um, you basically pull those sutures up, you have something down here that's helping to tension um, the sling so that you're not too tight on the urethra, and then up here, um, you just are tying those uh, sutures together, and usually, um, Usually I use about two or th two or three fingers um, in this area, just, you know, I have smaller fingers. Um, but definitely if you, uh, if you had a, a, a giant ham hand, you can definitely just use one finger. Um, Excuse me. Um, so yeah, complications of the autologous fascial sling. Um, there is a risk of lower urinary tract injury, um, as well as pelvic visceral injuries and blood loss. Again, it's, it, it is a little bit of a bigger, um, dissection as well as up here. Um, so it is a, a bigger surgery to do. Um, there's also concerns with wounds, infections, seromas, and abdominal fascial hernias. Obviously, you know, when you're closing this, you've got to make sure that you close the fascia well. Um, and then there is a higher risk of voiding dysfunction. And that really has to do with, again, the sling itself is placed closer to the bladder neck. And you, you do want this a little bit tighter than your synthetic slings. Um, so then you do run the risk of retention. Um, and then uh, as well as urge incontinence, more related to just kind of having surgery around the bladder and again a little bit more um, involved surgery than the synthetic slings. Um, and so this is the birch copo suspension. So again it's more of an open abdominal um, surgery. Um, the, the point of the birch copo suspension is to elevate the periurethral walls to Cooper's ligament. So again in this picture this is the urethra. Those are your periurethral walls. And so the idea is to kind of elevate the entire urethra to uh, again, create kind of more of a backstop behind it. Um, and this is what it would look like inside the abdomen. So you've got your Cooper's ligament here um, and you're suturing the, pel the periurethral walls up to that ligament. Um, so complications um, that have occurred with this uh, bladder lacerations, again, working close to the bladder, sutures through the bladder urethra because you're really close to those areas. Plus it's kind of, it is kind of difficult, um, uh, again, you have one hand actually in the vagina feeling the periurethral space and then you have your other hand up here 
um, actually placing the sutures. So definitely it's, it's, it's a tougher procedure to do. Um, some, some patients have had the Foley sewn into the urethra, um, and then you have issues with urinary retention, overactive bladder, and osteitis, osteitis pubis. Um, as you can imagine, nobody really does the birch anymore. I think, I think I've, I did like one or two in fellowship and residency, so really nobody does it. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of the end of our first case. Basically, the patient wants a sling. So that's it, so you do it. Um, so the second case we have is a little bit different. Um, so this is a 42-year-old G3P2 who presents with complaint of urinary leakage. Um, and her complaints are that she leaks with coughs, but only when she's sick. She wears a really thin panty liner if she's gonna exercise and usually it's dry and she's otherwise healthy. So what, what should we do with her? Any thoughts? What do you mean when she's sick? Like, uh, like, if she, like if she has a bad cold and she just is like coughing and sneezing a lot. I mean, so basically, I guess the question is, you know, do you think we, in terms of if you think about our treatment options, because again, we have like pelvic exercises, a pessary, a sling, where do we go from here? What should we do with this lady? I feel it's like you would treat her her exercises. Yeah, I mean, exercises is definitely a great way to go or um, or physical therapy again, if, if you thought that that was reasonable for her. But yeah, I mean, she really, she really doesn't leak that much and it, it kind of doesn't bother her that much. Um, so we see a lot of these patients too, where, um, you know, really what they say is, I just don't want this to get worse later. Um, and that's completely reasonable. And so I think for sure, like pre preventative care and doing what we can to just prevent this from getting worse in the future, such as pelvic floor exercises, making sure that she is good pelvic health um, is really all that we would need here. So, all right, so case number three, we've got a 70 year old uh, G3P3 who presents with a complaint of urinary leakage. So she has sudden urges to avoid and has to rush to the bathroom. She leaks with these urges often. They're sometimes small amounts, but sometimes everything. Um, she has to wear heavy pads when she leaves the house and she changes them three to four times a day and they're soaked. Um, she wakes up three times a night to avoid. She's never woken up already wet, but she's actually really afraid that she won't make it when she wakes up at night. And then she says, I drink water and it goes right through me. So she's been restricting her fluids because of that. Um, she also denies leakage with coughs, laughs, or sneezes. She hasn't tried anything uh, for this leakage in the past, um, and she has no other bowel or vaginal concerns. And then other past medical history, BMI of 25, 28, uh, hypertension, high cholesterol, she's had a cholecystectomy, and uh, again, she's G3P3. No, no real issues with her deliveries, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, so you do your physical exam. She has normal atrophic external genitalia for a 70-year-old, no prolapse um, significantly, and her PBR is 10. Um, so is there anything else that you want to do? So again, if we're thinking about like, besides like urinalysis and urine culture, like bladder diary, urodynamics, do we need either of those? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get any at this time. So, um, and what I mean by that for sure, like I said, if we, if we started doing some stuff to treat this and it wasn't getting better, then that would be a reason to do something more. But currently I think, um, and especially as I said, you know, in her history, she hasn't tried anything. So I think we don't have to do any other tests at this time. Um, so yeah, what, what do we think she has? Urge incontinence? Yeah. Um, so it's funny because, so the technical term is OAB wet, um, but basically she, she does have overactive bladder and then obviously she leaks with her uh, urges. So OAB is a symptom complex. 
Um, and uh, that's the definition from the International Continent Society. And so the hugest, most important symptom that people need to have with OAV is urgency. And when we say urgency, it's really that strong, sudden urge, have to run to the bathroom, gonna leak if I don't, can't make that go away, like have to go, versus you know any of these normal sensations that we normally get when we have to pee. Like people who can, people who can kind of defer their need to urinate at least a few minutes, maybe maybe doesn't maybe don't have OAB or or technically wouldn't be called OAB but yeah so it it has to be that super strong urge to go and people can have OAB with or without urge incontinence so again that's kind of where the wet versus dry comes from meanwhile nobody really calls it that so whatever but um i mean generally i just say Oh, I actually split them into two. I would say OAB and urge incontinence if someone had both. I wouldn't really say OAB wet. Um, and then oftentimes people also have frequency and nocturia. Um, so the symptoms of OAB can be caused by neurologic disorders. Um, again, it's we it's pretty common uh, when you have MS or Parkinson's, Parkinson's, dementia, spinal cord injuries to have uh, bladder issues. Um, urologic disorders like UTIs, bladder outlet obstruction, previous um, sling surgery, um, gynecologic disorders like um, prolapse, pregnancy or pelvic mass, uh, and then it can be psychosomatic. Um, and then most commonly it's just idiopathic. We don't have a great medical reason for it. So again, this kind of goes back to that slide about continence and real, ooh, what we're gonna be talking about in this part is really the nervous system control of the bladder. Um, everybody's funnest topic, neuro stuff. Um, so the, um, in terms of the sympathetic and parasympathetic control over the bladder, the sympathetic nervous system actually um, causes bladder relaxation or has a role in bladder relaxation. Um, so the neurotransmitter involved in this is neuro, uh, norepinephrine, um, and the input to the bladder is through the hypogastric nerve, um, which is, again, that sympathetic autonomic pathway. It's this chain, right, or the paravertebral ganglion chain right here, and T10 through L2 is the, um, the, spinal, the spinal cord um, origins of the hypogastric nerve. Um, the receptors are eta, uh, sorry, alpha and beta adrenergic, um, and the overall effect of sympathetic um, input to the bladder is relaxation of the detrusor muscle when norepinephrine binds to the beta adrenergic receptors. So the um, bladder contraction or voiding, if you think about it that way, is more related to the parasympathetic nervous system. So the nervous or the neurotransmitter um, associated with the parasympathetic system is acetylcholine, um, and input to the bladder is via the pelvic nerve. The receptors that um, are being acted on are the muscarinic receptors, and generally M2 and M3 um, are, are present in the bladder. Um, there's more M2 receptors in the bladder than M3 receptors, um, and the M2 receptors inhibit relaxation by decreasing cyclic AMP. The M3 receptors cause contraction by increasing IP3. So again, parasympathetic contraction, sympathetic relaxation. Um, so yeah, so th that's kind of an overview of like the nervous system stuff, which then kind of helps us figure out then how do we treat OAB. So treatment options for OAB, there's conservative management, including lifestyle and behavioral modifications, self-guided pelvic floor exercises, and of course, pelvic floor physical therapy. We also have pharmacologic treatment and then nerve stimulation treatments. So in regards to conservative management, um, when we're talking about lifestyle changes, uh, weight loss can actually um, really help with continence, dietary changes as well, and fluid management. So um, I didn't talk about it too much, but again, in your evaluation of a patient, you know, when we're asking them, how much do they drink? What are they drinking? Um, what are some of the things that they may uh, eat as well? Just because for sure, I mean, like coffee, you know, anything with caffeine can certainly kick up um, bladder symptoms for people. And again, also, if people are just drinking a whole ton, they're just going to have to pee more often um, and probably urgently. 
Uh, some behavioral therapies, um, such as uh, changing their avoiding habits, um, and then pelvic floor muscle training to improve strength and control. There's also urge suppression techniques to learn. Um, and all of these things can be done with uh, drug therapy if needed or necessary. Um, so again, uh, target, targets for the treatment of OAB, as I mentioned, we go, this goes back to the nervous system. So targets of treatment for um, OAB would be trying to target the beta adrenergic receptors and the muscarinic receptors. Um, so again, the, as we said, the parasympathetic system is what controls contraction of the bladder. And so, um, and if that is stimulated by muscarinic receptors, then we wanna use anti-muscarinic agents to work against contraction of the bladder. Um, on the flip side of that, the sympathetic system is related to relaxation of the bladder. And so we would like to stimulate those um, receptors and those are the beta-3 agonists. Um, and then also I didn't really go into it too much, which I will, but uh, we also have Botox injections that go into the detrusor muscle um, for relaxation of the detrusor muscle. So, um, oh, I should have flipped these. Okay, anti-muscarinic anti agents. Um, this is the stuff that you guys have heard of before. Oxybutynin, tolteridine, trospium, uh, sulfenicin, darifenicin, and fesoteridine um, with all of the brand names next to them. Um, oxybutynin has topical and transdermal um, uh, formulations as well. Um, you know, and as noted, interestingly, um, Again, these are kind of working towards the M3, M2 and M3 receptors. Um, M2 and M3 receptors exist all over our body. And so when we talk about the, the side effects of anti-muscarinics, um, when we talk about stuff like dry mouth constipation, um, all that kind of stuff, it's because those receptors belong, are living in those other areas of our body as well. So again, for instance, um, the parotid gland has M3 receptors. And so when people talk about dry mouth, it's really because the M3 receptors or um, the medications are kind of working on the parotid gland as well as the bladder. So, um, so going backwards. So uh, again, the way they work, they block muscarinic receptors inhibits bladder contraction. Side effects usually are dry mouth and constipation, dry eyes, blurred vision, dyspepsia, urinary tract infections, and urinary retention. These kind of go hand in hand. I think that the urinary retention, if it, if it does occur, it can lend itself to UTIs. Um, and confusion and memory loss, which um, we'll talk about in a minute. But usually, let's say the patient has these side effects. Um, what I normally tell my patients is if the medication works and we like it, but you have these side effects and they're bothersome, there's some things we can try to do to get around the side effects. So either changing the formulation. So as we said, um, oxybutynin comes in different forms. So potentially changing um, the form of the medication or also changing uh, short acting and long acting can sometimes be helpful for um, preventing side effects. Uh, changing medication altogether or just doing what we can to manage the side effects of dry mouth and constipation. Um, and then also just talking about the efficacy of these anti-muscarinics. Um, this study looked at uh, different medications comparing the efficacy and comparing adverse events. Um, so they listed these medications with the best efficacy and the worst adverse events um, were higher dosages of PO oxybutynin, but really the trials showed no significant difference between the uh, muscarinic agents. So contraindications and cautions for anti-muscarinics are narrow angle glaucoma, um, use and caution with people who have impaired gastric emptying or history of urinary retention, um, as well as be cautious for patients who already are on other anticholinergics. Um, and then our frail patients, there may be events seen that are not seen in, in other groups. There's cognitive impairment um, potential, as well as just in general polypharmacy for these patients. Um, so going into a recent um, study looking at anticholinergic exposure and risk of dementia, this is a group um, that looked at um, 
a whole bunch of patients in the UK. So basically about 59,000 patients with dementia and then 225,000 controls. Um, they looked at information on prescriptions for 56 drugs with strong anticholinergic properties. Um, and the exposure that they were looking for was total standardized daily doses that were prescribed in the one to 11 years prior to the diagnosis of dementia or equivalent date. Um, and what they found was that the adjusted um, odds ratio increased from one from 1.06 in the lowest exposure category to 1.49 in the highest. Um, and that was compared to people who are not taking any anticholinergics whatsoever. Um, and so in their conclusions, basically the exposure to strong anticholinergic drugs is associated with an increased risk of dementia, and there's a greater increase in risk in those diagnosed before age 80. So be cautious with the use of these medications in middle-aged and older patients. So with that, I mean, I generally, sometimes we're kind of forced to use it, but I, I do counsel my patients on this, and I do let them know that um, it's something that we need to look out for and would be potentially a cause for changing medication or doing a different type of treatment option. Um, so with that, I usually try to start with the beta-3 agonist, Mirabegron. This is the only one in its family so far. So um, unfortunately, we don't have much choice when it comes to this. And um, of course, I mean, when you guys when you guys do rotations with me, you'll kind of hear me say it all the time, but basically, unfortunately, we're really um, limited to what we can use based on insurance coverage. So Mirbegron has been out um, you know, for about, me, about a decade, let's say. Um, and so because of that, a lot of insurance companies don't cover it super great. Um, more and more of them are, but they're not right now. And so sometimes I have patients who are able to get it, but sometimes I, I, I'm not. So um, basically, Mirabegron at all three of the doses tested were efficacious in treating uh, OAB symptoms with their efficacy similar to anti-muscarinics, and it's been well tolerated among patients. Um, the side effect that I usually um, mention to patients is just the, um, it can affect blood pressure, um, so I usually have the patients keep an eye on their blood pressure, but it's pretty rare. Most people do very well. Um, with them. Um, so Botox injections, um, Botox is a highly potent neurotoxin produced by Clostridium botulinum, approved by the FDA in January 2013 for refractory OAB. Um, it is injections into the bladder. And the way they work is that they block release of acetylcholine from presynaptic nerve terminals. Um, so they paralyze the detrusor muscle. Um, and in terms of uh, Efficacy, um, continence rates range from 50 to 80%, and they generally last from six to nine months. So patients do need to return for um, repeat Botox. And the thing we look out for with Botox is urinary retention. Um, again, as we need the bladders to contract in order to empty, but if we're giving them Botox that kind of paralyzes the muscle, patients may not empty very well. So that's something that we just look out for. Uh, and we do these in the office. Um, so is PTNS. Well Sorry, is that well covered by insurance? Uh, actually, yeah, usually. Um, it's interesting. I think, again, the FDA approval was for refractory OAB, but I think more and more we've been seeing insurance companies, like a lot of patients actually don't really need to try other medications before it'll get covered. So. It's been pretty good. I mean, obviously, as always, there's like documentation, like you have to document that the patients have a PVR less than 150 to start out with. Um, and you do have to document that you've talked to the patients about the potential for urinary retention and they have to be okay with the idea of catheterizing, um, having a Foley placed or self-cathing. Um, so yeah, so PTNS is another in-office um, procedure that we do for OAB. It's uh, PTNS stands for peripheral or posterior tibial nerve stimulation. Um, so of course, as you can see in this picture, the tibial nerve runs down the leg, ends in the ankle, up here sits near the um, nerves that go to the bladder. And so the idea is that we're doing uh, with a small acu acupuncture needle in the ankle, sending that stimulation up um, to help uh, basically reprogram the uh, nerves for the bladder. Um, it's 30 minutes of stimulation, 12 weekly sessions, and then after that we usually do monthly maintenance. 
Um, it is for patients with moderately severe baseline incontinence and frequency. Um, but of course, those patients need to be willing to comply with the protocol and also are able to come in for all of those sessions, which really isn't always that easy for a lot of our um, elderly patients who need rides. Um, and then in, uh, in 2010, Peters et al. did a randomized trial just looking at PTNS versus um, sham uh, stimulation. And they found that 55% of those patients treated with PTNS had moderate, moderate or marked improvement in symptoms versus 21% in the sham group. So um, I, I mean, I, it's unfortunate that we can't offer this more because again, when we look at our patients who are older and who have polypharmacy, a lot of people don't wanna start medication. Um, and this is a nice alternative, but it's kind of like, this is a lot of insurance companies actually don't cover very well. So this is, you kind of need them to try medications and other more conservative um, things before they can do this. Um, and then lastly, we have sacral neuromodulation, um, which is the uh, inner stim. There's a new company out there who's also putting out uh, nerve stimulators. They're called Axonics. But basically, this is for patients with severe refractory OAB symptoms. Um, it is a surgical procedure. It's a two-stage process. Uh, we're lucky enough to be able to do the first stage in our office um, under local anesthesia. It's basically the placement of a temporary lead um, where you're, you're placing that lead into the S3 foramen, um, we can get a C-arm come up to our office, so we're able to, to do it uh, with fluoros fluoroscopy, which is really nice. Um, and this is just showing the, um, this is what it looks like uh, currently, although there is now a much smaller battery, but this is what the lead wire looks like, the permanent lead wire. So it has these little tines that are meant to hold it in place. Um, and this is the battery that gets implanted um, so yeah, so in terms of like the first stage, it's externally stimulate, externally stimulated, so an external battery pack for the, um, for the lead. If the results are positive, and by that we mean greater than 50% improvement, uh, the full implantation of the pulse generator and the permanent leads are performed. Um, and again, the lead travels through the S3 frame and to the S3 nerve root. Um, and the improvement is actually, we do have patients fill out a bladder diary prior to surgery or prior to the test and then afterwards. So that's what we, so we're kind of really looking for um, actual um, written data for their improvement. Um, so limitations and cautions of the procedure, there uh, can be plain pain at the implantation site. Um, sometimes there's lead migration leading to needing a revision of the procedure. Um, we worry about infection or irritation at, uh, at the site or trailing down to the sacrum. Um, and of course, uh, for the most part, um, the, newer, the newer devices are a little bit easier to use. In the past, there was this like, programmer that was super weird looking and it was really hard for patients to adjust things at home. I actually had a patient who like told me it wasn't working and I said, well, is it on? And she's like, I don't know. And then we check and we're like, well, the thing isn't even on. So that's why it's not working. So there's a lot of like user error with, um, with this. Um, it's, it's getting better in terms of how the company is kind of creating some like apps and stuff for patients to use. But you definitely have to choose your patients wisely for this. Um, okay, so it's kind of break time. I think we all need a little bit of a break for a few minutes. So here's my joke. Some of you have seen this before. Why can't you hear pterodactyl use the bathroom? Because the pee is silent. Um, so yeah, so I think, if, do you guys want to take a break? Do you want to do? Sure. Um, Maybe it, like we can probably do like a five, 10 minute break. Sounds good. Should we come back? Well, I've got, so should we come back at like 1025 ish? Sure. Okay, cool. Yes. Ooh. All right, cool. We'll do that. Um, and I think, you know, kind of more specifically related to like vaginal bulges. How long has it been there? Yeah. How far out does it does it go? <laughs> yeah. What other symptoms does she have? Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, how long has it been there? When do you feel it? Is it outside the vagina? Does it ever kind of go away and then come back? Um, have you noticed any bleeding or unusual discharge? Do you feel like the bulge interferes with urinating or defecating? And do you ever have to push it in in order to do those things? Um, and then what else, like urinary sim uh, incontinence symptoms or constipation? Um, so our patient has noticed her vaginal bulge for the last couple of years, but it's gotten worse recently. She feels like it's outside the vagina more than it was before. Um, it used to stay inside more often. Um, she does not need to push on the bulge in, uh, or sorry, she doesn't need to push the bulge into void, but she does feel like her urinary stream is a little bit off. Um, but otherwise, no, it, she does, she feels like she empties well and she, her bowel movements are fine. Um, no bleeding or discharge. Bulge is not painful. It's just um, uncomfortable and annoying when it's out. Um, so for her past medical history, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, she has diabetes. She has a history of a postpartum tubal. Um, she is a G3P2 with no assisted deliveries. She does think that she had an episiotomy with her first delivery and then tore again in the same place during her second delivery. Um, but she doesn't recall that it was overly like a really bad tear as far as she's aware. Um, her last menstrual period was uh, 50, when she was 50, no postmenopausal bleeding and no history of a hormone replacement. So with physical, physical exam, again, we want to look at the external genitalia, um, look at her vaginal mucosa, perform a bimanual exam, but of course the process is the POP-Q. Um, so before we go into the POP-Q, I'm just going to give you little bit of a review of prolapse. Um, so pelvic organ prolapse occurs in 30% of women aged 20 to 59. Um, I would say probably higher than that when we include the higher age groups. Uh, lifetime risk of undergoing surgery for a prolapse or incontinence by age 80 is, uh, is reported to be 11%. Some degree of prolapse is found in nearly all Paris women and many of them are asymptomatic. Um, and really, that's, I think that's really because the symptoms are more common once the prolapse starts to descend past the hymen. Um, so this is uh, an overview of the POP-Q. It's kind of a busy slide, so I apologize. Um, so when we're doing our POP-Q, we're looking at certain points inside the vagina, and we perform the POP-Q when the patient is uh, doing a Valsalva maneuver. Um, so the pop cue consists of this um, three by three table. Um, the AA point is three centimeters proximal to the urethral meatus, so it sits about here. The BA point is the most prolapsed portion of the anterior vaginal wall, and C is the leading edge of the cervix or the cuff. Um, GH is the middle of the urethral meatus to the posterior hymen, um, and PB is the posterior hymen to the middle of the anal opening. Um, so of course, GH really just stands for genital hiatus and PB stands for perineal body. So those are kind of easy to remember. Um, and the TBL is the maximum death, depth of the vagina when the prolapse is reduced. AP is the, three cent is the point three centimeters proximal to the posterior hymen. BP is the most prolapsed portion of the posterior wall. And D is the posterior fornix if there's a cervix present. Um, if she's had a total hysterectomy, then there is no D. <clears throat> Um, and then I did have here, I had a link to the um, AUGS POP-Q tool, but it doesn't work really well. So I just want you guys to take a quick peek at what that looks like, if I can find it. Oh, here it is. Okay. Let's see. So can you guys all see this AUGS website? Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so um, the PopQ tool is actually really nice to play around with. Um, so it shows you, or uh, this is like what I use to counsel my patients in the office so that they kind of understand what's happening. But basically there's these different scenarios. It's um, uterus pregnant, uh, present or no uterus. Um, and then we talk about when, because when we're talking about prolapse, we divide the vagina up into those three compartments, the anterior wall, posterior wall, and then the apical. 
side of the vagina. And I think it's useful to kind of show people what's going on because a lot of patients will kind of say like, oh, my bladder's falling out or, oh, it's my uterus. And then I examine them and it's something totally different. Not that, I mean, usually it doesn't matter, but it's more so for us, like if we're going to perform surgery, then it's really important for me to know which side is coming down. Um, but it's nice because you can kind of show patients like, well, this is kind of what it looks like. This is what's coming down. Um, you know, similarly with the anterior wall, kind of doing that. Um, and I just, I feel like it's just really helpful to counsel the patients with, but as a learning tool, I feel like it's kind of fun for you guys too. Like you can just play around with these things, see what it looks like. There's also a, where is it? Oh yeah. There's a way to put in your own, um, like your own exam and then kind of see, it can kind of show you what, what, things look like so for instance that's if you thought that the anterior wall come to the uh, just comes to the introitus you can play around with that and see what it looks like so um, that's just like a fun little thing to to do every once in a while if you're trying to learn a little bit and understand what's happening with prolapse um, okay all right so we're back to our the PowerPoints up again Yes. Okay, cool. Um, all right. And so just another quick little um, explanation about um, the POP-Q. So the POP-Q staging is actually fairly new. I mean, that's 1996. Prior to that, we had the, bottom, the Baden-Walker halfway system. Um, so the Baden-Walker halfway system is sometimes people would call it like grades, like grade zero through four versus POP-Q is stage zero through four. Again, not, I mean, it's, it's a matter of terminology, but I think more often we are more used to, or I'm more used to thinking about it in stages uh, versus definitely, I would say, um, older physicians, people who are training um, earlier um, would talk about the grading system. I feel like the POP-Q stages are a little bit more um, accurate in terms of trying to actually figure out distances. I mean, we're talking about centimeters here, whereas this one talks about just, it's at the halfway system because we're talking about how far the prolapse is um, in, in, in reference to the hymen. So again, like their grade one is if the prolapse is halfway to the hymen, their grade three is if their prolapse is halfway past the hymen. I mean, it, it just, I don't know, it just seems a little bit wacky to me. Whereas this is like actual distances, it kind of just makes more sense. So um, that's just kind of the difference. So more and more, you know, we recommend that people really try to use the POP-Q staging. Um, in terms of the stages themselves, stage zero is like absolutely no prolapse whatsoever. So just imagine like presumably someone who's like 15. Um, stage one is, um, when there is some sort of prolapse, um, but it's way beyond, it's, it's like, it's not way beyond, but the prolapse is more than one centimeter above the hymen. So stage two is actually um, the, the most distal part of the prolapse would be either one centimeter above or below the hymen. So that's where, um, when we look at the actual numbers that we use, it would be minus one, zero, or plus one. Um, stage three is when the most distal portion of the prolapse is more than a centimeter um, below the hymen, but no further than two centimeters less um, than the total vaginal length. And stage four is essentially everything out. Um, and to get technical, it would be that the most distal prolapse protrudes to at least, um, at least two centimeters, um, or to at least two centimeters less than the total vaginal length or all of it. Um, I actually, the other thing I didn't put in here, but the other thing to notice is that, so this AA point and the AP point are never going to be more than three because the actual distance that you're looking at is three centimeters. So an AA point could never be like plus four plus meaning outside the vagina, just because it's only three centimeters long. So it could never be four centimeters long. Um, so that's just a little thing to look at when you look at 
potentially when you look at numbers, the AA and the BA, uh, the AA and the AP would never be more than three. Um, so back to our patient. Um, so for example, or I mean, bleh, in terms of her physical exam, the external genitalia is normal, atrophic for a 64 year old, uh, vaginal mucosis also normal, um, bimanual exam, fairly normal, palpation of the uterus, really nothing unusual there. Um, and her pop Q looks like this. So her AA point is plus three and her BA point is plus three. So meaning that her anterior wall comes out to about three centimeters beyond the hymen. Her serve, and this is again, the pop Q is done when the patient is val do, performing a valsalva maneuver. Um, so on the exam, you basically have the patient bear down for you. And I, we do this supine usually, um, but depending on the situation, I do sometimes have patients stand. Obviously gravity helps pull things down. So um, I do sometimes have patients stand to do the exam. Um, but yeah, her cervix on Valsalva comes only to as far as minus eight. Her GH is four centimeters. Her PB is three centimeters. Her total vaginal length is 11 centimeters. Her AP is uh, at minus two centimeters, so two centimeters inside the hymen. Um, and BP is also minus two. And then her D or posterior fornix is minus 10. Um, uh, and just a word about measuring this actually. So um, they have this thing called a pop, pop Q stick, which basically looks like a popsicle stick that's marked off in centimeters. So some people actually use that to measure, like to actually physically measure um, their pop cues. Um, when I was in fellowship, we would just take those like giant scopet swabs and our staff would just like with a Sharpie mark off 10 centimeters um, on the stick. So that's what we used. Um, but the, so that's how you're measuring um, how far things come down. I think also, you know, as OBGYNs, we're really pretty good at estimating centimeters with our fingers. So that's really one of the other, that's honestly what I use in the office um, to estimate. Um, so just in general, prolapse terminology, um, I throw this in mainly because again, there's over the years, there's been a lot of different terms to say the same things and patients will kind of hear different things too um, and kind of say them back to you. And um, so obviously you kind of wanna know what they're talking about um, and potentially if it matters, you can also kind of um, be able to correct them. Um, in terms of that kind of stuff. So um, the older term for anterior vaginal wall prolapse is a cystocele, just meaning the, the bladder is um, protruding down. Um, posterior vaginal wall prolapse is rectocele. Um, a procedentia is actually a complete uterine prolapse or what we would consider a stage four uterine prolapse. So really just everything coming out. Um, and an apical prolapse is the general term to mean the prolapse of the top of the vagina. So that could be either the uterus or the cervix or the vaginal cuff after a total hysterectomy. Um, and so yeah, back to our patient with her pop Q here. Um, what would her diagnosis be? And obviously you can tell me which wall of the vagina is prolapsing and stage for her. Stage three anterior. Yes, good. So again, real quick, I mean, and I know it's, um, it's kind of like if you need to, obviously you can always refer back to that um, that table of like definitions, but basically stage three is anything beyond one centimeter outside the hymen. So for her, if her um, prolapse is at three centimeters outside the hymen, that's where stage three comes from. Um, and then of course the top here, or obviously the little a means anterior. Um, so treatment options for prolapse, uh, pelvic floor physical, there's really only three, pelvic floor physical therapy, uh, pessary or surgery. Um, so this is just a little information about pelvic floor physical therapy in the treatment of prolapse. Um, so there was, in 2014, there was a multi-center randomized control trial at 23 centers. Um, they looked at women with newly diagnosed stage one, two, or three prolapse, and they were randomized to either therapy or a prolapse lifestyle advice pamphlet. I'm actually, I would love to read what that says, but anyway, um, what they found is that women in the, in the physical therapy group had significantly greater reduction in prolapse symptom scores at 12 months. 
um, and the 2013 International Consultation on Incontinence Report concluded that there is level one grade A evidence to recommend physical therapy for treatment of prolapse. Um, just uh, what I usually, when I counsel my patients on the use of physical therapy for prolapse, I do let them know that, you know, we don't expect the physical therapy to actually like fix the wall. Like it's not going to really put the wall back to the way it was. But a lot of times physical therapy can actually help with the symptom of a bulge. Um, and a lot of that really has to do with kind of increasing that muscle tone, muscle strength around the pelvis. Um, and it does kind of, it does tend to keep the prolapse inside more often so that it would be less bothersome to patients. Um, so yeah. Um, and then, oh, pessaries we kind of talked about before. Basically, pessaries like, pessaries come in many different shapes and sizes and they sit inside the vagina and keep the bulge inside. So again, they don't fix the wall, they just keep everything inside. Um, in terms of surgeries for prolapse, uh, we have a vaginal versus abdominal approach, which is dependent upon the type of prolapse. Um, usually, if you have an isolated anterior or posterior prolapse, you can manage that with just a vaginal repair. But if an apical prolapse is present, um, either alone or in combination with the anterior or posterior, um, the surgery can be either vaginal or abdominal. But the point with that is that you do need to suspend the apex. So this is um, just a table uh, describing the different types of prolapse surgery. Excuse me, I forgot to mark this down. This is actually from the uh, ACOG practice bulletin on pelvic organ prolapse. So um, you have, this is, I kind of just like this table. I think it's really nice to just really quickly summarize what kind of surgeries there are. Um, so you have your sacral copal pexy, which is meant to really correct the apex uterosacral ligament suspension, also for the apex, uh, and usually performed at the time of hysterectomy um, because you're with the uterosacral, you're entering the abdominal space. So it makes sense when you have a hysterectomy to be able to do that. The sacrospinous uh, ligament fixation is also for the apex, and it can be performed at the time of hysterectomy or post-hysterectomy. And with the sacrospinous uh, ligament um, suspension, you're actually not entering the ab um, abdominal cavity. Uh, it's extra peritoneal. Um, and then in terms of the other vaginal uh, repairs, you have an anterior coporphy or anterior repair for the anterior wall, and that's done um, obviously vaginally, um, and a posterior repair. And then on this list, they do mention uh, vaginal repairs with the use of mesh materials. So... These were all removed from the market by the FDA in April 2019. We don't do them anymore. So they were actually, um, I do have a picture of one of them in, in this lecture, but they were mesh kits with mesh pre-cut and pre-sized um, for the use of prolapse um, surgery, for vaginal prolapse surgery. Um, but again, there was a lot of controversy with the use of mesh um, um, for vaginal prolapse repair. And basically a lot of that controversy comes from um, patients who were experiencing a lot of scar tissue in the vagina, dyspareunia, um, bleeding pain, just a lot of issues with the use of these meshes. And um, so that's why they've been re uh, removed from the market. Um, so I know I didn't mention it, but, and again, it'll come, but the sacred copopexy is actually uses permanent mesh material for, um, in order to support the apex. Um, it is considered different type of mesh because it's not placed through the vagina. It's placed through the abdomen. Um, it's also shaped and sized differently. And it just, it, the space that it's being um, placed is different than the vaginal meshes. So it really is considered a different mesh. Um, I definitely have to counsel a lot of patients regarding the use of mesh for any of these surgeries, um, just because there's been so much uh, talk in the media and lawsuits about that stuff. But again, currently they're not available. Um, so yeah, you don't have to worry about it. Um, so in terms of um, surgeries for the apex. So the McCall coldoplasty is one of these procedures um, where if the prolapse is mild, um, people can perform a total vaginal hysterectomy and a coldoplasty. Um, 
the caldoplasty also can close a redundant cul-de-sac and an enteroseal, um, but it also provides apical support and vaginal lengthening. Some people believe that it should be standardly done with a total vaginal hysterectomy, and it usually per is performed after the uterus is removed. So again, it's an intraperitoneal procedure. Use, and it's, it's uh, kind of, it, it's basically, again, closing, making the cul-de-sac smaller. Um, so a modified McCall's is when an elliptical wedge of tissue is excised from the interior posterior vaginal wall to narrow the vaginal vault. So again, it's kind of in this picture, you can kind of see that there's kind of a lot of redundant tissue here. So a wedge um, shaped area of tissue is just removed. Um, and then uh, the, the peritoneum is, is closed up and that is also brought a little bit closer to the apex. Um, so the uterosacral ligament fixation suspends the apex of the vagina to the hollow of the sacrum. Um, it's preferred by some who feel that it allows for suspension um, without distortion of the vaginal uh, axis. Uh, it can be performed laparoscopically or abdominally, but usually vaginally. Um, let's see. The uterosacral ligaments attach between S1 to 3 or 4 on the anterior surface of the sacrum and insert into the posterior cervix at the level of the internal os and sometimes the upper posterior vagina. Again, when you're doing um, uh, hysterectomies, I believe you know most people, you can easily identify where the uterosacral ligaments are. Um, it consists of fibroelastic and smooth muscle tissue. The ureter lies lateral to the anterior margin of the ligament and the distance um, at the level of the sacrum of the ureter um, from the uterosacral ligament is 4.1 centimeters. At the ischial spines, it's 2.3, and at the cervical os, it's 0 0.9. So again, you know, we always talk about being careful where the ureter is when you're doing a hysterectomy because it's really close to the cervix. Um, the superior glute gluteal vein lies beneath the uterosacral ligament, um, and in the in intermediate portion of uh, the middle rectal artery is near the inferior margin of the ligament. Um, so this is just a depiction of performing the uterosacral lig ligament suspension. So here you've had your uterus removed um, and with that you can grasp the uterosacral ligaments, throw your sutures um, through the ligament and through the vaginal cuff and basically this is kind of um, from an abdominal view looking down towards the pelvis that you're um, suspending the vaginal cuff to the uterosacral ligaments. Um, and this just shows different levels of um, uh, attachment when you're doing a procedure like that. So the McCall coldoplasty uses the uterosacral ligaments, but kind of a little um, further down in the pelvis. The traditional uterosacral suspension goes a little higher, and then the modified high uterosacral suspension kind of goes really, really far back. Um, the sacrospinous ligament fixation, um, the sacrospinous ligament runs from the ischial spine to the lower portion of the sacrum and the coccyx. Um, sometimes it's grouped in with the coccygeus muscle and referred to as the CSSL. You can identify the sacrospinous ligament by palpating the ischial spine and tracing, basically tracing medial and posterior to the sacrum. Um, it can be performed with a hysterectomy or a hysteropexy. Um, so you can leave the uterus in place and kind of just push everything up. Um, the pudendal nerve lies behind the ischial spine and the vessels lie directly posterior to the ischial spine. The sciatic nerve lies superior and lateral to the sacrospinous ligament and the inferior gluteal artery runs along the sacrospinous ligament midway between the sacrum and the ischial spine. So I have some more anatomy pictures to show you with those. Um, so again, with the sacrospinous ligament fixation, so here is your sacrospinous ligament. When you're performing the procedure, we have this instrument called the capio, which is because really you're going so deep in the pelvis, this, this is all by feel, you're actually not able to see the sacrospinous ligament. Um, and so the capio is a device that helps you place the needle around the sacrospinous ligament without actually being able to see it. Um, and so this picture actually shows a unilateral sacrospinous ligament fixation. Um, there have been studies showing that you can do it bilaterally as well, and there, there's no, really no difference in outcomes. 
um, in regards to how well the apex is suspended. I tend to do a bilateral mainly because I feel like it might, it might be weird for the, for the vagina to skew off to one side, but again, there's really no difference. Um, and there have been times where I would do a, utero, a unilateral um, sacrospinous if, uh, if I felt like one side was really difficult or if there was scarring or something like that from previous surgeries or previous injuries um, for the patient. Um, but usually, and usually I just place two sutures um, for each side. There's also an iliococcygeous fascial suspension, which is really similar to the sacrospinous, but basically if you, um, for patients who have shortened vaginas from let's say prior surgery, um, and you're unable to reach the sacrospinous ligament, uh, you, can, um, you can suspend the apex to the iliococcygeous fascia. Um, so outcomes of these apical surgeries, the McCall's caldoplasty has a cure rate of 88 to 93%. The uterosacral ligament suspension um, has very good success rates for the apical um, compartment and still really good for the anterior compartment as well. Um, and the sacrospinous ligament fixation has recurrence in 37% uh, in, in the anterior compartment and, and about 14% in the apex at 72 months, but uh, subjective long-term satisfaction is 90%. Um, and we do know, I mean, patients are more likely to be satisfied if the prolapse was stage three or stage four pre-op, which kind of makes sense because when there's a prolapse hanging out that far and then you put it inside, people are pretty happy. Um, risks of these procedures, um, cystotomy and rectal injury, again, you're working really close to the bladder or the bowels. Um, your ureteral compromise is the most worrisome complication, and that's really with the McCall's or the uterosacral ligament suspension, because again, you're working pretty close to the ureters, um, and of course, they're usually recognized on cystoscopy. Um, there's a risk of hemorrhage because the inferior gluteal vessels, as well as the hypogastric or pudendal vessels, are close to the uh, sacrospinous ligament. Um, and when a sacrospinous ligament fixation or high uterosacral is performed, patients generally have uh, nerve pain and buttock pain, which usually resolves by six weeks. Um, and then there's also a risk of vaginal shortening, stenosis, dyspareunia, and scarring. But again, that also Anytime we do vaginal surgery, um, even with like a regular anterior or posterior repair, those are risks of vaginal surgery. So this is just showing um, the proximity of the, um, the vessels to the ischial spine. This triangular part marked with gray dotted lines is um, where the sacrospinous ligament is. Um, so you have your internal pudendal artery, intern, inf uh, inferior gluteal, arteries, um, again, just kind of really running close to the, um, to the uh, sacrospinous ligament. So when we place our sutures or the mesh, although again, we're not using mesh anymore, but that was those mesh kits that we would use for vaginal repairs. You want to place those about 25 millimeters um, away from the ischial spine. It's really kind of like the midpoint of the uh, sacrospinous ligament. So in terms of other vaginal procedures for, um, for uh, prolapses, we also have a coplicolysis, which is the obliterative, obliterative procedure. Usually this is for, tip, uh, for much more elderly patients who have a lot of comorbidities and definitely for someone who's no longer sexually active. Um, basically because this surgery is closing off the vagina or, or really significantly shortening the vagina. Um, I counsel those patients really, really well on not being sexually active anymore, um, just because I've heard horror stories for patients who, after a couple crisis, will say, when can I have sex again? And it's like, oh, you, you can't have penetrative sex. Um, you can have external stimulation and, you know, that kind of stuff, but you cannot have penetrative intercourse anymore. Um, so I always make that very, very clear with my patients. Um, so the coplicolysis can be done uh, either concomitantly with a hysterectomy or with someone who's had a hysterectomy um, or as a Lefort procedure. So the Lefort procedure is when you leave the uterus in place and basically push everything back in. Um, so if you are performing a Lefort, you do need to uh, make sure that the patient has a um, negative pap smears, uh, recent negative pap um, and evaluation of the endometrium, again, because you're leaving the uterus in place, um, but essentially 
blocking off any easy access to the uterus. Um, so you want to be sure that everything looks good and you're not leaving um, any sort of suspicious or cancerous uterus in the body. Um, this part in terms of looking at bladder function, um, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that in a, in a minute, but basically um, when we have a prolapse significant enough and we're worried about any sort of urinary function related to that, um, we would want to do some office testing prior to surgery um, because we can counsel them better on what things might look like after surgery. So there is a 33% risk of de novo stress incontinence post-op, um, and there is a 2% risk of voiding dysfunction. So again, any information that we can have pre-op to, to let us know what things might look like is um, very useful in counseling and, and kind of making your surgical plan. The success rate for copoclysis is 90 to, 90 to 100%. Um, most of these patients do have elevated PBRs related to uh, their prolapse, and so 90% of those resolve. Um, and then in terms of postoperative morbidity and mortality, there, uh, in two, two to five percent of patients, there's a partial recurrence or breakdown, um, and usually uh, secondary to hematomas or infection. Um, there's a five percent chance of cardiac thromboembolic pulmonary and uh, cerebrovascular events. Again, that's more so just in the fact that you're performing surgery and going under anesthesia. Um, what I thought was interesting was that there's zero to 13% um, of patients had regret. So again, that's where the counseling goes into as well, kind of really making sure that um, they, they understand that there's gonna be no more penetrative intercourse. Um, recently, I've also had to counsel patients on, on kind of telling them that their external genitalia is gonna look perfectly normal, because um, there are some patients who think that they're just gonna look like a Barbie doll and that it's gonna be weirdly smooth down there, which is not the case. Um, so these are just, um, these are just pictures of how the uh, procedures are performed. So the Lefort copoclysis, again, you still have a uterus in place. And essentially what you're doing here is that layer by layer, you're kind of pushing the cervix and uterus back and then tying down these sutures. So you're layer by layer, you're imbricating the prolapse so that it kind of pushes backwards. Um, and then similarly for the copoclysis, uh, and so of course here, what happens is that the, um, the vagina, the skin, the mucosa of the vagina is taken off and it's taken off in rectangular pieces anteriorly and posteriorly. Uh, the other thing that we do with the Lafort, because the cervix and the uterus is still there, we actually leave these tunnels on the side. Um, and actually, you can see it better here. So these tunnels are left on the side um, to help if there's any sort of drainage from the cervix or uterus, or potentially if something does start bleeding, if there's something there that, you know, even despite your careful um, evaluation, you know, if, if the uterus starts bleeding and you need to know about it, that'll come out of those tunnels. Ooh, whoops, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, got it. Okay, we're back. Um, so, so yeah, so that was the Lafort. Again, the, uh, as I said, you're leaving these tunnels open so that any drainage from the uterus and cervix um, can come out in case something happens and then you would notice that there's bleeding. <clears throat> Um, and so a copoclysis that's performed um, for someone who's already had a hysterectomy, essentially you kind of skin the whole vagina. And similarly, now you're using purse string um, layers to push the prolapse back, to, oh, oh, geez, tie your layer, uh, and then keep, keep pushing it in, keep tying, so that eventually it kind of looks like this on the inside, where you have your layers of sutures that's pushed everything in. I know it's kind of hard, like, I feel like once people see it, everyone's like, oh, so sometimes it's just really hard to tell from these pictures, but like, once you actually see one, you're like, oh, okay, that makes all, it makes perfect sense. Um, okay. 
So yeah, so then in terms of um, other surgeries for apical prolapse with really with mesh augmentation, um, as I said, the only mesh augmentation surgery that we have now is this acrocopopexy. And that can be done either open, laparoscopic, or robotic um, assisted. Um, I mentioned vaginal mesh again, but we're not doing that. Um, so the abdominal sacrocopopexy has been used since the 1960s. Um, with the mesh that we use, it's large, poor, lightweight polypropylene mesh. Uh, and this is kind of, this is what it looks like. Um, and the mesh gets attached to the posterior, the anterior posterior vagina and the cervix, um, if there is a cervix placed. So really, in terms of performing a super cervical hysterectomy, I mean, most people don't do it. And I think most people don't see a reason for it, which I, I kind of agree with, but I do do it when I'm doing the sacrocopopexies because the cervix, um, basically gives a really good anchor for the mesh to be attached to. Um, and it also really plays a role in mesh exposure in the vagina, <clears throat> um, um, basically to protect against that. So, um, and then the tail of the mesh here is attached to the anterior longitudinal ligament at the level of S1, S2. And so that's just another look at that. Um, so in terms of laparoscopic and robotic um, sacrocopopexy, I mean, generally speaking, nobody really does open sacrocopopexies anymore unless, um, unless there's just some difficulty that kind of requires you to do an open surgery. Um, <clears throat> so advantages over open surgery, again, you have good visualization, shortened hospital stay, decreased post-op pain, better cosmetic appearance. Um, some of the disadvantages with doing laparoscopic or robotic is just in general the learning curve. Um, you know, new, newer surgeons, may, bleh, excuse me, new, newer surgeons may have longer operative times and cost. Although, obviously, for you guys, I mean, now more, more and more people are just being very well trained laparoscopically and robotically. So I really feel like operative time it, it's not that long, or I mean, um, like the learning curve is not that high. Um, the approach is determined by patient preference, surgeon skill preference, um, patient age, weight, need for concomitant pelvic surgery and surgical history. Um, and of course, just in terms, just like what you do for any like laparoscopic hist, you have to consider the use of intra-abdominal insufflation and positioning in patients. Um, you know, going back to the whole patient preference thing, when you guys rotate through with us, you'll see Dr. Capes does all of her um, sacrocopopexies straight stick lap laparoscopic. She's amazing. Um, she makes it just look so easy. Um, and I do them robotically. And so she was actually trained in both, but when she started here, it was just kind of easier to, for her to do it laparoscopically. So she just continued doing that. Um, but, you know, so that's kind of the whole like surgeon skill preference. I mean, really either way, it, it still it still works so um, relevant anatomy here just kind of looking at the abdominal wall this is the stuff that you need to know for any fairly pretty much any um, laparoscopic surgery so not just our not just the sacrocopopexy or hysts um, and then trocar placement usually there's a 10 port in the right lower quadrant because that's where you're going to be tying your knots um, from and that's where you need the suture and the needle to go through there's a five millimeter port in the left lower quadrant um, sometimes you might need a side port at, um, by the um, umbilicus um, of course we perform the hysterectomy first usually and then from there, we also want to look at our landmarks. You want to know where the sacral promontory is, the right common iliac artery and vein, the middle sacral artery and vein, and of course the ureters. Um, so this is actually the robotic arm placement. It was, it's always kind of been this, what we call like a lazy W. Although now, so that's really for the Da Vinci SI um, version but now with the xi you can actually i've been going kind of straight across with my instruments just because the robot arms um, are able to do that better so um and then really in the procedure um after you've um after you've done your hysterectomy and you you're basically making your bladder flap, really um, dissecting the bladder away from the vagina. You also are uh, creating a dissection at the rectovaginal space. Um, 
the in, and in terms of vaginal manipulation, so usually again we're usually performing a, a super cervical hist, so you don't really need like a full um, uh, a full uterine manipulator for this part. Um, you also want to be able to expose the sacral promontory, um, and the peritoneum over the promontory is open. The periosteum is osteum is exposed. Um, and again, you're looking for that anterior longitudinal ligament. When the mesh is brought in, it's sutured anteriorly to the vaginal apex, um, again, usually the cervix, and then um, secured to the anterior posterior vagina. The mesh is then pulled toward the sacrum. You have tension on, uh, or rather the tension on the anterior vaginal wall and the apex is determined with vaginal exam. Um, and the mesh is secured to the anterior longitudinal ligament with two to three sutures and sometimes tacks. Um, and then the peritoneum is closed over the mesh at the sacral promontory. Um, and again, straight stick versus robot. The robots associated with higher costs, longer OR times, more post-operative pain in the first two to five weeks. Although I'm not really sure I, I don't know why. I, I actually don't think I have a lot of patients who have more pain in the first two to five weeks um, than regular laparoscopy. Um, and then outcomes are considered equal. So in terms of outcomes of sacral copopexy, um, so there was this trial called the CARE trial. It's the copopexy and urine reduction efforts trial. Um, the trial actually originally was looking at the use of um, incontinence surgery at the time of copopexy, but because they have all this data looking at um, looking at outcomes, that's why they also kind of talked about how well the sacral copo or the how well the um, copopexies were working at that time. So um, the risk of recurrent prolapse um, by anatomic de definition was 22 to 27 percent at seven years, um, and symptomatic definition was 24 to 29 percent. Out of that, out of those numbers, though, only 5% of patients sought retreatment. Um, there was complications of corneal abrasions, subcutaneous emphysema and hypercarbia, presacral bleeding, bowel obstructions, uh, any new injuries, osteomyelitis, um, and uh, mesh erosion. The risk of that increases um, over time. Uh, it was 10% at six years in the trial. Um, oh, and then this is just um, a picture of the mesh that used to be used for vaginal uh, prolapse surgery. So again, and so if you imagine, I mean, this is all done vaginally. The mesh is placed, this is kind of a weird picture, but there's imagine a vaginal incision on the other side. The mesh is placed right over the vagina and then um, sutured in place, but it's going to those sacrospinous ligaments. We don't, again, we don't use them anymore. Um, and then anterior and posterior repairs are pretty much the same. So this is just um, a picture of an anterior repair, but basically you are making an incision in the skin of the vagina, dissecting off the underlying um, fascia from the mucosa, suturing that together. Um, this actually, apparently they use two layers of sutures. I usually use one, it depends. Um, and then you just, so that resupports the wall, and then you just sew the tissue back over. So back to our case. I feel like that was like a thousand years ago. Um, back to our case. Um, so let's say that she wants surgery. So again, we have our stage three anterior prolapse. What else should we be thinking about? What else do we need to do for her? Eurodynamics. Yeah, so yeah, we need to consider urinary function for her, like figure out a little bit more of what's going on. So for her, why do we, why do we care about her urinary function? Um, basically, uh, this group in 1983 reported that women with no symptoms of stress incontinence may develop signs and symptoms after prolapse treatment, whether that's surgically or with the pessary. Um, and again, that's due to the correction of the anatomic urethral kinking or obstruction from prolapse. So that kind of goes back way back to that picture of the hammock theory that I was telling you about, where usually when a prolapse is, especially an anterior prolapse coming out, it usually obstructs the urethra from emptying all the way. So most women with prolapse actually don't have um, any incontinence because usually the urethra is kinked so much that they 
um, that they're not losing urine. Um, but of course, if you imagine kind of pushing everything back um, with either surgery or pessary, that kinked urethra straightens out and the flow of urine is a lot easier. So, um, so that's why we care about what's going on with her bladder or urinary function. Um, you know, if we didn't do anything and just kind of performed our surgery or placed the pessary and she started leaking, her satisfaction completely decreases um, when, when incontinence develops. Um, and it's also important for us to know because the um, incontinence <laughs> surgery can be prepared at the time of prolapse repair too. Um, so in order for us to um, assess what's going on with her bladder, we can either perform urodynamic testing or actually perform a full bladder cough stress test with prolapse reduction prior to surgery. So for instance, like the other day, I actually had a patient who she's like pretty straightforward, didn't really have any other symptoms. Um, I had her come back to the office for just a full bladder. I just, I just reduced the prolapse with like scopettes and I had her cough for me um, to see if uh, anything would happen, which it didn't. Um, we also have this OGS uh, risk calculator um, on the website where we're looking at, um, it calculates the risk of the development of de novo stress incontinence after prolapse repair. That it takes into account age, vaginal deliveries, um, comorbidities like uh, BMI and uh, diabetes. Um, and so it kind of, it's, that's kind of really helpful as more of a counseling tool. I don't think it changes too much for us um, other than that. But I think some patients kind of like to hear like that there's numbers involved in terms of their risk if they, if they don't proceed with um, urodynamic testing. Um, the, other thing, the other thing I didn't mention too was that sometimes on urodynamic testing, the, um, the, the prolapse reduction, the cough stress test with prolapse reduction may actually be completely negative. Um, and then it's kind of, you know, I, I tend to then counsel my patients about the fact that, again, even though it's negative on your dynamics, your dynamics is actually kind of an artificial um, situation. It may not fully represent what's going to happen after surgery. And so that's also where the risk calculator can come in to help counsel. Um, I do have some patients who kind of like let's, you know, if the testing's negative, um, I'll talk with them about, you know, it's their choice that they can choose to have a, um, a sling placed anyway. And I think every person is different. I've had some patients who will say, um, no, I, you know, I'd rather wait and see what happens versus people who are like, oh, you're in there anyway, and I'm already asleep, just do everything. So, um, but again, it's all about counseling and it's really helpful to kind of have some information behind that. Um, eh. Okay, so next case, um, I have uh, an 82-year-old with a vaginal bulge and recurrent UTIs. Um, her vaginal bulge was present for years, but not that bothersome. She's also had six UTIs in the past. She's been having issues with UTIs on and off for the last few years. Her UTIs are usually E. coli and they're pan-sensitive to antibiotics. She denies any vaginal bleeding. She has to urinate every hour, but sometimes she feels like nothing's coming out. Um, sometimes she feels like her urinary stream is slow and she's not emptying her bladder all the way. She does not splint to avoid and she has no incontinence otherwise and no other pelvic issues. Um, so her BMI is 35. Um, she has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, hypothyroid. She's a G4P4 with four vaginal deliveries. She had a TVH at 50 for menorrhagia. Um, she's pretty sure her ovaries are still there. No, hist uh, no history of hormone replacement therapy. Um, so she has a large vaginal bulge pro protruding outside the vagina. Her pop Q is um, that. So she... So she basically has a stage three anterior and apical prolapse. Um, and so again, what else should we be doing for her? Or what, what other part of the exam or testing that I didn't mention should we, do we wanna know? So, I'll get, so obviously the hint's there, but really I didn't say anything about what her PVR was. So she has a bladder scan PVR of 320 which is obviously pretty high. Um, and so what does that mean for us? Like, what, what do we wanna do now? Um, so this goes into the whole urinary tract infections. So I'm gonna pause here and just say, I have like six more slides. I know we're a little bit over time. We can probably get through these real fast if you want to. 
You're totally so. okay. Keep going. Okay. Um, so yeah, so real quick info on UTIs. Um, and I hope, I think hopefully in the future we can kind of do a little bit more on um, some of the other um, Eurogyn type stuff, but really brief with UTIs. So the most UTIs are the most common bacterial infection. It c accounts for more than 8 million office visits um, and 1 million ED visits. And there's about 100,000 hospitalization hospitalizations per year for UTIs. Women get them more than men. Um, and that's really just because of the shortened, women have a shorter urethra or yeah, shorter urethra and thus a closer proximity from the vagina to the rectum. Um, Office visits for UTIs are actually 35 times more likely for women than men, but as uh, we, as the population ages, um, it actually cuts down to two to one, um, just because male factors of aging, such as BPH, can cause more infections for men. Um, the external one-third of the urethra is colonized by vaginal and enteric flora. 80 to 90% of infections are from E. coli, 10 to 20% are from sap saprophyticus. And then we've also seen proteus, pseudomonas, klebsiella, and enterobacter, um, and also enterococcus. Um, so recurrent UTIs defined as three or more culture positive urinary tract infections in the last 12 months or two in the last six. Um, there's a 50 to 70% lifetime probability that a woman will have at least one, two, one UTI and 20 to 30% of these will have recurrence. Um, there's a couple different definitions for recurrent UTIs as well. We would consider it being a relapse if you had the same bacteria within two weeks of completion of treatment um, or a reinfection if it's more than two weeks after treatment or test of cure. So this is um, risk factors for recurrent UTIs in women. Um, I would say we could focus really more on like the postmenopausal causes, but um, these are just kind of the thing, you know, I have a lot of patients who kind of ask like, why, why does this happen? Um, I would say probably the biggest ones is the lack of estrogen and the PVR for a lot of patients. Lack of estrogen is huge for postmenopausal women. Um, so what do we think? I mean, in our case, what do we think is contributing to frequent, her frequent UTIs? Again, she's 82, she's never had hormone replacement, and she has a PBR of 320. That and her lack of estrogen? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and then so for her, what would you suggest? So yeah, so she has, um, she has a prolapse, she obviously has an elevated PBR, most likely contributing to her urinary tract infections. What would we do for her in terms of um, treatment? Um, so I think, I mean, for her, I would probably suggest a pessary trial first um, to see what, what I'm looking for there is if we can find a pessary that fits and keeps the vaginal bulge in, then I would like to see how, what changes for her PBR. And if her PBR goes down and she's emptying well, that actually could really help um, her pre prevent her from having urinary tract infections. Um, oftentimes, I also usually recommend um, some vaginal estrogen, estrogen cream to just bring back some of that estrogenic um, health to the vaginal tissues. So, so yeah, that's that. It was a lot. Um, I'm at, that's it. Um, any questions about anything? I know it was kind of a whole lot of stuff. So. And I'm sure, I think that at some point you guys will have another review of things prior to CREOGS too. So, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, and then I actually, I just, I threw this in here too, just as some resources. I mean, these are definitely the things that I, like, I really, really liked the Williams GYN section, or in, in Williams Gynecology, the section on um, FPMRS. Um, as a resident, I thought that it was really clear, good pictures, really straightforward. Like, I just felt like it really helped me understand, like, what was going on for all of these things. So that's a good section to look at. Um, and then obviously, we always have our practice bulletins that kind of help a lot. This stuff um, down here, like the fecal incontinence, sexual dysfunction, chronic pelvic pain, all that stuff, I think is, it, you know, it kind of falls into the Eurogyne um, um, category-ish. Um, and I know, um, I mean, hopefully we can kind of get to some of those in the future, because I feel like we do a lot of incontinence and prolapse, but there's obviously all these other aspects. 
that you need to look at. And I think, um, you know, other things too is just, I know Creag's kind of looks at all this stuff too. So having some formal lectures on like bowel disorders and stuff would be really helpful. So that's all I got. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Yeah, you're welcome. I've, again, Thank I know, I know it's like a whole lot, but um, hopefully you glean something out of it. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome.